It's time for the Douglas Coleman Show. Mr. Smooth and Savvy is joined by guests from all walks of life. From the entertainment industry to authors to political and social commentators. The famous and not so famous. The controversial and the light and fluffy. We have it all. Now, here is Douglas Coleman. Well, hello there. How are you? Welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show. It's me, Douglas Coleman. How are you? Thank you for joining us. Nice to have you with us here as always. Camille James Harmon is here today. Camille is an actor, and she's in the new Adam McKay film called Vice, which is a story about former Vice President Dick Cheney. She plays Mary Matlin, and the film stars Christian Bale as Dick Cheney, which in itself is nothing short of a miracle, I think, to transform Christian Bale into Dick Cheney. And from the pictures that I've seen, I've not seen the film yet, but from the pictures that I've seen, it is an amazing transformation. He looks the part. So please check out the film Vice. It is in theaters now and uh, will probably be on video on demand in the near future. So very excited to have Camille here with us. After the interview with Camille, we've got some music to play. Uh, Some of our old favorites that I always like to play. Figured we'd start out the new year with these. The music will be as follows. The Never-Ending Pageant by Colin Klein. Followed by Berlin by Airport Impressions. And then Butterfly by Haley Loren. Half Light, Half Sound by Acne Giants. And finally, My Destination by Kyoto Candy. So, a very full show. We will be right back with Camille James Harmon. You're listening to Mr. Smooth and Savvy right here on the Douglas Coleman Show. We'll be right back after these commercial messages. Hi there, this is Stuart Epps, record producer. This is my story about Elton John uh, working with him in those early years, going back to 1967 at Dick James. Uh, all the amazing tours, those first recordings, uh, going through to Rocket Records. And uh, it's an amazing story about his incredible rise to stardom and my part in that. So uh, look forward to taking you on that journey. So here we go. Yeah, and to order this great audio CD, please just email me at stuartepps at talk21.com. That's Stuart, S-T-U-A-R-T, Epps, E-P-P-S, at talk, T A L K. 21 in figures.com. Stuart Epps at talk21.com. Email me and I'll give you all the details for buying this brilliant audio disc. Thank you. Bye. Tired of living in a culture of lies, fake news, and alternative facts? The Pro Truth Pledge reverses the tide of lies by calling on politicians and everyone else to commit to truth oriented behaviors. The pledge asks signees to commit to 12 behaviors that research in behavioral science shows lead to truthfulness, such as clarifying one's opinions and the facts, citing one's sources, and celebrating people who update their beliefs toward the truth. Private citizens who sign the pledge get the benefit of contributing to a more truth-oriented society. Public figures get more substantive rewards for signing the pledge in the form of positive media and public recognition. The pledge crowdsources the truth by asking volunteers to evaluate the statements of public figures who sign the pledge. Take the pledge, demand that your elected representatives do so, and encourage your friends to take it at protruthpledge.org. And now... Hey, Rocky! Watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat! (laughs) See? (laughs) Nothing up my sleeve! Presto! (laughs) Wrong hat! Now here's something we hope you'll really like! Okay, please welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show, Camille Harmon. Hi, Camille, how are you? Hi, Douglas. Nice to be on your show. I'm excited. Thank you for coming on. Your husband was on about two and a half years ago. We looked it up. He was on in July of 2016, so uh, two and a half years already. And I remember we had a nice conversation. He's an astrologist. Is that right? Yes. He's an astrologer here in Los Angeles. He has clients all over the world, though. You know, astrologers basically work on the phone and the Internet. So he works at home. 
and he's on a phone call right now with someone. Um, he's very busy this time of year because he does a lot of New Year's prediction shows, and I am his office manager, so I am handling all of that right now. <laughs> so I'm doing double publicity duty. <laughs> So let me ask you, do you guys, obviously you would do your own charts as well, right? Yeah, and he predicted me uh, having a career peak starting last year, and you know, I was really looking forward to that, and it seems to be happening, so I'm excited. Well, that's great. All right. Well, let's do a little bit of your background, and oh. then we'll talk about your new film that's coming out. Or is it out already? It's out. Oh, it's out. Okay. Yeah. All right. So... According to your bio, you are from Louisiana, mm -hmm. and are you of uh, Cajun descent? You know, I was adopted by a Cajun, but um, I was born in Shreveport, which is not Cajun at all. And then I was adopted, and I grew up in Lafayette, which is smack dab in the middle of Cajun country. <laughs> and, and then I went to graduate school in New Orleans, and I also have a lot of family from New Orleans. So I'm from all over the state. Okay. All right, because now I've traveled down in that area, and I know a lot of people that uh, are of Cajun descent, and it's a interesting group of people. They're kind mm -hmm. of, uh, I don't know, it's like uh, when the French originally came there and settled, they kept a lot of the culture down there. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's interesting because the French came from France into New Orleans area, and then the French came via Canada down the Mississippi and settled in what's Cajun country. So the Cajuns are really from Canada. They're French from, you know, that way. They were escaping religious persecution. Um, so they were Catholics escaping the Huguenots, and they came to Canada, and then they escaped again and came down to Louisiana. So, yeah, basically the culture is really Catholic. You know, all the all the feast days and the partying and everything comes from the, the feast calendar of Catholicism. Right, yeah. So, okay, so you grew up there, and how did you get started in drama, in acting? I, well, I was kind of a late bloomer. Um, when I was in college, I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. So I got a degree in general studies, arts and humanities, which was wonderful, actually, for an actor, because I got to learn a little bit of everything <laughs> and design my own degree. It was really <laughs> fun. And... While I was in college, I started acting with a community theater, and I just loved it. It just clicked. And so it, I was in my early 20s, I guess, when I started. And then um, I moved to Richmond, Virginia, and I continued acting there with a company called Studio Theater of Richmond. And it was wonderful. It was theater, and I originated roles in a play. Um, I worked as a stage manager and an actor, so I had the behind the scenes and the on stage experience. And then I got the bug to go back to graduate school, so I applied in New Orleans and I got an assistantship at the University of New Orleans, so that was great. So I moved back to Louisiana and got my master's. And they were, it was a great school because they allowed us to work on the side acting. They said, we're not like those conservatories that say, oh, you can't have an agent, don't audition for anything, just be in school. They actually encouraged us to have an agent and go out and work. So when I graduated, I had film credits, I had commercials, TV, I had my SAG card. It was great. Now, I want to ask you, um, it says that you have a degree, a master's in fine arts and drama. It's in um, drama and communications. Yeah, it's an MFA in drama and communications is what they called it. Okay, because... I studied acting when I was about 19, 20. I went to the American Academy of Dramatic Art in New York. Mm. And then I went, that didn't work out. I dropped out and went back to what I called real school. <laughs> and I, I got a degree in business, okay? Now, what would one do with a Master's of Fine Art and Drama if you weren't going to be an actor? I mean, is that applicable to anything else? Well, my defense of acting degrees that I have to give is, well, the easy answer to that is, yes, it's applicable to other things, but you have to stretch your mind a little bit to see that. I mean, the nitty gritty of what you learn is applicable to acting, obviously. Um, but the art of acting and the, the skills you learn in being in productions, particularly well, that was a theater-oriented school, but they did have a film school associated with it that we, you know, we did some films through the film school as well. But you learn things like, 
project oriented commitment. You learn teamwork. You learn uh, how to be reliable, right? Because if you're in a show, you can't, I mean, if you're sick, too bad. You basically have to perform sick. Uh, there are very few situations that budget an understudy, for instance. So you learn responsibilities that other people in other careers may not learn. Um, and you learn how to work well with others. Those are the kinds of skills that I would say that you learn. You learn communication skills. You learn public speaking. Okay. Because I, I just, from my own experience, I remember that the school would have been great as far as, and and I think more before than now, but like if you got out of there, the people would come looking for you, casting directors. They would right. come to the school and say, oh, we need one like this. We need, you know, whatever. But if you were to go out on your own, having a degree or having a piece of paper, I don't even know if they call it a degree, from there really wouldn't do much for you. You know, you know, nowadays the whole thing has changed because everything is internet-based, right? right? Yes. And social media-based. So my son's an actor, for instance, and he's 16, and he's not academically inclined at all. He hates school. He's not like me. I was, you know, I loved school. I was front row teacher's pet, taught by nuns, you know, straight A's, and he just hates school. He's more like his father. So, you know, he'll probably... um not go to college and I'm not actually encouraging him to go to college because the because of the way he is and he's very mechanically inclined he'll probably go into the trades he may get like a mechanic certification or something um, or sell cars or sell motorcycles he's very charming and good-looking and mechanically inclined but he hates school so you know everyone's different and I mean the kid has credits you know he's 16 he's got a SAG card he's got an agent he's got a manager so I just you know I don't encourage him to go to college well, it isn't for everybody. And, you know, I went at the sort of rough persuasion of my mother, um, you know, who kind of said, oh, stop all this nonsense about being an actor or a musician. You know, you'll never amount to anything in that. And, you know, it was all of that sort of story. So I ended up doing working in a corporate job and then came back to it now, 20 some odd years later. You know, now I'm working on music. Now I'm doing the radio show. So <laughs> it kind of came full circle. But, uh, you know, it isn't for everybody. I absolutely hated going to college. Absolutely hated it. <laughs> but it did get me a good job for 20 years. So, you know, you have to horses for courses, I guess. Yeah. You know, I worked so many weird actor. I, I wouldn't call them actor jobs, but they were not jobs I earned by having a degree. These were jobs that I did because they were flexible. You know, I was a substitute teacher. Well, actually, I did have to have an, a degree to do that. I was a substitute teacher in LA Unified for nine years. If that doesn't teach you improv and public speaking, I don't know what does. <laughs> you know, getting in front of a group of kids that don't know you and having to hold, hold court for the whole day, sometimes with no lesson plan. That was a great experience. And I, I was a faux finisher. I did catering. I did many presidential events. I had to um, follow Chelsea Clinton around for two days with a silver tray with Diet 7 Up. Um, <laughs> wow. I have a lot of adventures. I was a zookeeper. Um, I did a lot of strange things, you know, to make money on the side. And uh, I, I, like you, I took a big break from acting um, and came back at it, you know. And now I'm in my early 50s. And I'm just now seeing success. So, you know, it's it's interesting how life goes. I took a break. I took a break to raise my kid. And I took a break um, because I had, I mean, to be honest, I had some paranormal experiences that kind of took over my brain and made me obsessed with um, the UFO field. And I ended up becoming a journalist for UFO magazine for five years. I, I was obsessed with that stuff. I was I went to England. I walked in the crop circles. I went to Roswell. I, I covered a lot of conferences and went way down the rabbit hole with that. So, um, you know, it was interesting. But I came out of that and kind of, you know, now I'm like, okay, been there, done that, bought the T-shirt. And um, I'm back into acting again. So I got to ask you about that since you brought it up. <laughs> Uh, were you a an abducted person? Did you were you alien um, abducted? Yes, I confess that that was the way I interpreted my experiences at the time. Yes, uh -oh, okay. but I now 
I now see that phenomenon differently. So I'm not trying to deny the experience. I just have interpreted it a different way, which is also controversial. And I now think that that experience could be um, some kind of a demonic attack, to be honest. And I know that's controversial. I mean, everything I do is controversial. Even this film I'm doing right now is controversial. But it seems to be my my makeup. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of embarrassing for me to talk about it all now because I'm back in acting and, you know, it's not really conducive to being cast on a Disney show to have this in my background. <laughs> well, all right. I won't push it any more than that. Um, <laughs> It's going to come up, so you know. Well, it's interesting you say that, you know, everything is controversial because it seems like our whole society has just gone oh, eating, you know, eating controversy for breakfast and everything becomes controversial, whether it ever was or is, or, you know, people are I just know. making controversy out of nothing. But it's ridiculous. That's a whole nother story. I did want to ask you one question about SAG. On your bio, it talks about SAG credits. And I know that a SAG card is something that most actors need because it's like a union card, right? It gets right. right, and you pay dues to it. And so, what is a SAG credit? How does that work? Well, a SAG credit comes from working on a SAG project, and it's kind of the the, the ways of getting a SAG card are varied. Um, I was I got my SAG card in New Orleans, when I was cast on a SAG project, I was what they call Taft Heart Lead, which means they made an exception, they cast me as a non-SAG person because I could do a British accent. And so it's a special form they fill out that brings me in. And then I become what's called SAG eligible and I can join. So that's how I got in. My son got in as an infant and I just delayed him joining. He worked on a show um, called Baby Bob as an infant. It was like talking babies and he was one of the babies they switched out. So there are many different ways you can get in on SAG and there's some controversy as to whether it's worth it in this new um, emerging market because there's so many non-union jobs. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of nice to be SAG eligible because you can do both. And then once you go SAG, you really aren't allowed to do non-union jobs. And um, there, then your job market shrinks. But the SAG rates and the SAG benefits are so good. So, you know, when my son joined SAG this year, I said, okay, now you're going to have a lot fewer auditions. But when you get a job, it's going to be a better job with better pay. So it's a rite of passage. And it is necessary eventually. Uh, but you don't want to become union too soon when you don't have enough credits to compete with the other union people for those choice jobs. So when you say credit, that means film. Uh, yeah, film, TV. Um, you know, there are so many things called new media now. There are a lot of shows on on the Internet, on YouTube and um, other formats where you can also, you know, have clips of yourself and, and use to get more jobs. Right. Well, I mean, there is so much indie film out there now most of the guests that i have these days are indie filmmakers at least 50 percent of them and it's just amazing to me how much is out there that people are literally doing this from their house and putting out great films i mean stuff that you really say for the dc franchise comics or star wars or something like that just a regular film about a love story, a romance, a drama that people are doing from their home that looks as good as something that the major studios would put out. Yeah, well, the, the changes in technology have made that possible. We have a small production company, my husband and I, and we have some amazing gear. And you can acquire, you know, really good gear enough to make a feature film for less money than you used to be able to do it. As long as you know how to light things, the cameras are so good today, you really can make it competitive, you know, with the a film. Well, of course, we have really good cameras. We have an Ari Alexa XT. You know, we have a lot of good stuff. Um, but that's what's really changed it, is that people can afford to make amazing independent films um, these days. And then, you know, everything's digital. So you don't have to pay for film processing. Right. And distribution, you can pretty much do yourself as well because it's all on the Internet. 
it's really revolutionary. You know, the, what's great for actors is there's so much content. I mean, I try to keep up with the shows, you know, and it's impossible. I mean, there are just too many shows. And if I get an audition for a show, I'll go look it up on on demand or something and watch a couple of episodes. But I, I there's just, you know, it's totally changed. You can't watch everything. Oh, it's impossible. I mean, aside from all the network shows and cable shows, then you've got Netflix and Hulu and yeah. Vimo. And I mean, it's just, you could literally watch 24 seven and still not, you know, even make a dent in what's out there. It's, right. it's really but great amazing. for actors. There's more work than ever. Well, that's true. That's true. There is. Although I don't reckon that these guys doing independent films are paying that much to their actors. But I think it's good experience for people yeah, that are starting. Some of them are. Some yeah. of them are. It depends. There's so many different levels of contracts. Well, that that's are true. It's SAG. Yeah. You know, there's SAG new media contracts where you make 150 bucks a day, um, you know, and, or less than that. And then, you know, there's the normal. It, the, the contracts are based on the budget of the film. So, yes, there there's a scale, right? So if you're doing a big big picture like Vice, this film I just did, had a $60 million budget. So we got paid well. We got paid top shelf rates. Well, let's talk about that. Since you brought it up, that's a great segue. The film is called Vice, directed by Adam McKay, and he also wrote it, I think. Yeah. Yes. And the film, why don't you tell us just basically about the film? What's it about? The film is a biopic of Vice President Dick Cheney. It is uh, technically considered a comedy, at least in the Golden Globes category. That It's got six nominations in Golden Globes. Um, the reason is it's kind of a mixture of drama and dark comedy. If you saw Adam McKay's film, The Big Short, it's similar to that in format. It tells a very complicated historical story, but inserts comedic bits that pull you out of the drama style of the film and take you in another direction and then place you back into the drama style of the film. So it's very jarring stylistically, and that's very fun to, to watch. Well, that sounds really interesting because, I mean, off the top of my head, I can't think of a less funny person than Dick Cheney. <laughs> yeah, um, and Christian Bale is such a master actor. Oh, my God. Just to be in the room with him as Dick Cheney, I was so mesmerized by his energy and his ability to stay in character all day long, between takes, everything. Um, I mean, the guy was amazing. He had to go to set like at 4 in the morning and get in makeup and then work all day, carry the film. <laughs> And the prosthetics and things he had to wear were so well done. I mean, you couldn't see anything. I mean, he was just Dick Cheney when you, you were around him. One thing that was interesting, the set, it, we shot at Sony, and it was icy cold. They had to keep the whole soundstage air-conditioned. Um, I don't know what temperature they kept it at, but it was pretty cold. And the reason is because there were so many actors, not only Christian Bale, but Steve Carell was wearing prosthetics and wigs and such. Um, a lot of the actors were in heavy prosthetics and hair pieces, so they would get hot otherwise. So for the rest of us who were running around with our natural hair, <laughs> we were freezing. <laughs> uh, but it was worth it. I mean, I understand why they had to do that. You know, it was it was really uh, impressive. Well, just that image I'm getting now of Christian Bale, uh, who is a, a fairly young, handsome guy. Exactly. <laughs> and Dick Cheney, who is neither of those two. To, to transform Christian Bale into Dick Cheney, that must have taken some work. Was oh, this yeah. one of those four hours a day kind of? Yeah. Like make, I said, he had to get deals? there, I believe it was four in the morning, and then start shooting around eight. Yeah. And so every day he had to go through that. And in the film, you see him in many different over many decades. So you see various, you know, degrees of this aging process. And he gained 40 pounds. Um, he had to wear a fat suit for some of the uh, age ranges. And so he had all that going on. He had to wear contacts because he has brown eyes. Cheney had blue eyes. There was a lot he had to deal with as an actor physically, you know, and then to be such a 
great actor. And plus, of course, you know, people sometimes forget Christian Bale is from Wales. He has a British accent. Right, right. So he had the voice down so perfectly. I was like, wow. It was, it was, it was one of those I am not worthy <laughs> you know, moments. To wow, be that, that must have been business. really amazing to, to work with him. It, um, it was. Because, yeah. yeah, he was my favorite Batman, I think, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, well, except maybe Adam West, but that was, you know, <laughs> a whole different genre of Batman. The thing about um, my, well, my stress levels on working on the film just for excitement, you know, I, I didn't see the script. I didn't know until the night before who was in my scene. Uh, and when I read the call sheet, I realized I was going to be in a scene with Christian Bale, Steve Carell, Eddie Marsan, Don McManus, Justin Kirk, you know. And I was the only woman in the scene. That was my first day of shooting. And it was my birthday. So I was like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and then Adam McKay, he directs from another room where he's watching the monitors. Because the room was full of people with, you know, cameras and lights. And it was small. So I hadn't met Adam McKay. And he just comes over the speaker. And he's, he says, so, Camille, uh, first of all, we hear it's your birthday, so happy birthday. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> and everyone clapped. And then he said, so when Christian says this, can you say this? And he starts throwing lines at me. And I, thank God, I was given a prop notebook, and I was scribbling lines in the notebook. And I had to just keep up. And he's very improvisational like that. So he would change it up. We would do it different ways. And, you know, the same thing for my second and third days of shooting. It was it was very much like, let's try this. Let's do this. Um all of this while he's in another room, coming over the speakers like, you know, Oz and the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was really fun and I had to I had to be on my toes. And, you know, I had researched Mary Madeline. I had watched videos of her. And I have a lot in common with her actually. I really enjoyed reading her book, for instance. She lives in New Orleans now with James Carville. So I really enjoyed uh, a book they wrote together called Love and War. And um, I actually wrote her a letter and sent it to her through her church because I know where she goes to church. And I don't know, you know, what she's going to think of the film. She's probably going to hate it because she really likes Dick Cheney. And um, she was his advisor. She, she worked very closely with him in his vice presidency. So, but I felt compelled to write her because we had a lot of things in common. We're both half Irish. We both are Catholic. Her daughters went to the same school I went to, things like that. Um, Anyway, it's just we're doing a very highly charged political film in this climate. You know, it's 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 like some people love it, some people don't. The reviews are all over the place. But it was really exciting for me as an actress to do it. And it's the biggest film I've been in so far. It's not the biggest role I've had, obviously, but it's the biggest film I've been a part of. Okay, so let's you brought up the character. Your character is Mary Madeline. And why don't you tell us again what what she did? Yeah, her title was uh, counselor to the vice president. Okay. And she ran the Bush Cheney campaign. She was um, a longtime head of the RNC and political advisor, pundit. She had her own show on the news for a while. She's married to James Carville, who is a famous Democratic strategist and campaign runner. Um, so they have worked at opposite ends of the spectrum for people and uh, they're still married. Well, <laughs> that is amazing. amazing thing. Yeah. And um, I really enjoyed reading their book because they would, she would write a chapter and then he would write a chapter and they would discuss different ups and downs of their life together from their own perspective. And for instance, when, when Bush won, right? So Mary's all happy and then she gets offered this job in the white house with Dick Cheney and you know, and so James is upset and bitter and <laughs> resentful. And then when the Clintons won, you know, it's the other way around. So they have a very interesting marriage um, in high level politics that they somehow managed to keep together. They don't talk politics at home. But so she worked very closely with Dick Cheney. And that's why she's in the film. Now, you reminded me of uh, Arnold and Maria Shriver. I mean, there was another you mm -hmm. know, sort of power couple that were at opposite ends of the political spectrum right well it's interesting maybe it's religion that holds them together religion and family because you know they're both catholic 
and uh, James Carville and Mary Madeline are both Catholic, and I'm Catholic. So I don't know. Maybe you know, it's just certain things are bigger than politics that make it work. Well, God, I hope so. I mean, yeah. there has to be more to life than politics. Please, it's exhausting. Yeah, and you know, maybe people like that, maybe people like Mary and her husband, um, can just they can talk about it. It's like business, and then at the end of the day, you put it on the shelf, and you forget I about guess so. it. You, you know. know? Would have to be so. How how big is your part? I mean, how much how much are am, you in this film? I, I have um, a couple of lines. I have a couple of scenes. I mean, I work three different days with three different setups. But you know, it's not that big of a part. I when we shot it, I probably had about six lines that we shot, and then you know, four of them didn't make the cut. It's kind of how it worked out. Um, and that's normal. You know, that's what happens. I'm glad to be in it at all because they're well. It's a huge film. I, I have a lot of friends who are in it, and I, I know people who were in it and didn't make the cut. And uh, it, there are like 150 speaking parts in this film, so wow. I'm one of many. I, as a matter of fact, I didn't even get a ticket to the premiere, which was really upsetting to me because I hired a publicist, and she was upset. But apparently it was in a really small theater. It was at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, and that's a small building. And there are just so many people involved in this film. They couldn't have all the cast go. So I have a lot of friends that were in it that didn't get to go to the premiere. But that's life, you know. I'm hopefully going to go to some parties during award season. Well, yeah, that's, that would be good. That's what I'm waiting for now. <laughs> I want to wear dresses. <laughs> so how did you get this part? I, I self-submitted. I had an agent at the time, uh, but or close to that time. But what happened is my agency lost their franchise with SAG. So I could no longer be with that agency. So all of a sudden I found myself unrepresented. And at the time I submitted for this, I submitted myself. I submitted myself on Actors Access. And the only way it was des described in the casting was feature film looking for these historical figure lookalikes. So they had listed a few people, and Mary Madeline was one of them. And I thought, well, I kind of, you know, I don't really, really look like her, but I have the right hair, you know. And... um so I, sub I self-submitted, and then, uh, you know, they said, well, come in as Mary Madeline, you know, circa the year 2000. So I went online, and I looked her up at that time and saw her hair and her outfits and, you know, what was going on, and I dressed the part, and I went in, and there, it was only me and one other lady they were seeing, and I knew I got it because I just looked more like her than the other lady, bless her heart, but I knew I got it. And so they told me the next day that I had it, so it was really that simple. Now, at that point, do you think your SAG card helped you? Well, I know. I mean, I couldn't have done it if I weren't SAG. I oh, was so you, you had to yeah. be SAG even to get to get in the door. Yeah, that's a good you know. question. I don't know. I mean, obviously, if they really couldn't find a lookalike, they would have gone out of the union and tapped Hartley, the person. But there's so many actors in L.A. that are SAG. I knew they'd find the right person that was already SAG. You know, that wasn't too hard. Can anybody just join that, or do you have to do something first to get, like, invited? In other words... You, yeah, I, no, you have to become eligible. You okay. can do it by doing... It, it's complicated, and I, I really don't know how to explain it well, because 20 years ago, it was slightly different than it is now. And, like, you can do... And I, and I don't have that good of experience um, even explaining it for my son's process, because my son, like I said, he became eligible when he was a child. And then we left, we left L.A. and we moved to Arizona for 10 years. And then we came back. So we started acting again like three and a half years ago. So he already hit the ground running. Um, I don't really know how it is. Apparently you can, you can be in one of these low-budget new media SAG things where they're allowed to hire a certain amount of SAG people and a certain amount of non-SAG people. And so you can get in that way. and then, Or you can do background for SAG things. And then when you get a certain amount of background vouchers, they're called, then you can join. So those are the ways that I, I know of. I'm not really an expert on SAG. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. <laughs> I've been in it so long. I just don't worry about all that. The reason that I ask is because for aspiring actors who show up on the doorstep in Hollywood wondering if they need a SAG card to do anything, and how no, do they go no, about getting them? And, so, work. They should work yeah. non-union and build up credits. And build up credits. Okay. Yes. All right. Well, listen, I think we've covered it all. Anything else you want to talk about? Uh, you got any new projects coming up? I have another film coming out. It's called Loquisha, and it's a feature comedy. I went to a screening a couple of weeks ago. It's funny. And I play a news anchor in that. It's just a one-liner. 
so I'm, you know, I'm looking forward to bigger parts. My, um, I have an agent now. I have a manager now. My husband says I'm coming into this astrological career peak. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, so I, I just think that this film will open some more doors for me um, to, to get auditions for really good stuff like television shows and things. Because of my age and my type, I play professional women or moms, you know, older moms, like moms of the college kid, moms of the high school kid. Um, and I can do that really, really well. I mean, that's what I'm comfortable doing. So I would like to maybe get on a medical show or get on a detective show, or be a lawyer, be a doctor, be another anxious mom. I'm, I'm open, anything. Um, but that's kind of my type, you know. Okay, so the film is called Vice, and it is out now. Where is it available? Everywhere? It's in theaters everywhere. It opened on Christmas Day. Oh. So it's in okay. a lot of theaters right now. So it's on theaters, and then it's going to move to what's the process? It goes. No, then they go usually to um, on, demand on demand or um, yeah. streaming. You know, they go to Netflix um, DVD packaging. You can buy the hard copy DVD. I know that Adam McKay said um, he's going to put a lot of deleted scenes in the DVD, which will be fun. Um, I know he said he shot a whole musical number that didn't make the final cut, and that's going to go on the DVD. <laughs> That'd be fun to see. A musical? Yeah, based on like Hamilton, you know, like this great. They had the choreographer oh, the, from okay. Hamilton do it, and then they didn't even include it in the final version. Well, that sounds funny. So please <laughs> check out the movie Vice with uh, Camille Harmon playing Mary Madeline. And best of luck to you. Thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it. It was nice You're talking to you. Thank you. You're listening to Mr. Smooth and Savvy right here on The Douglas Coleman Show. We'll be right back after these commercial messages. Acclaimed author of Garden, Jane Yates brings you the first book in a new trilogy, Octopus Pirate, a story of a foundling who has unusual talents, such as the ability to communicate with octopuses. As a baby, he was washed up on an island off the Scottish mainland. An eccentric former nun who lives alone with cats brings him up. He joins a circus and narrowly escapes plots against him. Flees to Cornwall, builds a replica pirate ship that's also an airship to travel back in time to fight real pirates. Get your copy today from Amazon, only 99 cents. DJC Music and DJC Productions are pleased to announce a brand new website. We have started a listing website for radio show hosts as well as potential show guests. This is a meeting site where hosts and guests can come together. Show hosts can list their show and types of guests they're interested in booking. Potential guests can list their talents, bio, accomplishments or anything they feel makes them an interesting radio show guest. There are no recurrent payments, only a one-time $5 listing fee. Your listing will stay up until you decide to cancel. Previous guests of The Douglas Coleman Show are welcome to submit their guest listing free of charge. Go to radiohostsandguests.com. That's radiohostsandguests.com. Bye. 
no more how I love that light. But it don't help when the nights get long. I'm too tired to right all the wrongs I must have done to end up so far gone. But my sweet friend, the angel, you're floating on the wind. Tell me, this is not the end. And you say, you say, you say that I just gotta play this game and I'll leave the life. And someday, 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 I'll look back and see all the pain and fear was a lie. You gotta die a while to come back, a butterfly. When it comes to change, all I know is to rage against. It don't matter the cage I'm in, still feels like a home to me. But then the rain comes down, and I'm afraid that I'll drown in here. Cover my hair, but it's loud and clear. There's only one way out, an old cruel world. You break me out of all my shells. I guess you know me well, and you say. You say, you say that I just gotta play this game and I'll live it alive. And someday, 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 I'll look back and see all the pain and fear was a lie. You gotta die. A Reaching for the wind, longing to begin again. But.
anyway, that's what the management said.
that's about all the time we've got for the show today. I want to thank my special guest, Camille James Harmon. Best of luck with the movie Vice. Also, thank you to Colin Klein, Airport Impressions, Haley Loren, Acme Giants, and Kyoto Candy. This is Douglas Coleman saying, I'll see you when I see you. It's a pain.